Next slide. Okay, coal. A little bit about coal. Uh, obviously, it's a combustible, sedimentary, organic rock. It's mainly hydrogen, uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. It's formed from millions of years of vegetation that is compacted pressure and heat in the strata. And it's about 50% of our electrical energy in the United States is provided by coal. How much do you think in South Carolina is provided by coal? It's about 25%. Where do we get most of our energy in, in South Carolina from? Nuclear. It's over 50%, right. This is a statistic that's kind of amazing. Um, we burn about a billion tons of coal in the United States each year. That's 3.8 tons for each person, each of the 300 million-ish people in the United States. Multiply that, you get a billion tons. And in the world, about 5 billion tons. So it's, it's kind of amazing that we use 20% of the world's coal supply. We use a lot of coal in the, in the United States. Go ahead, next slide. And this is coal production in various countries. These are some of the peak ones. You can see the United States is somewhere around half. And depending on what source you look at, you can find that number anywhere from 49 to 56%. But it, it is somewhere around 50%. Poland, 92%. China, this is a bit of a concern. 79% of their electrical needs come from coal. And they're building, what, John, a plant a week now? one fossil plant a week to keep up with the growing energy demand in China. Go ahead, next slide. And remember, going back to how that energy conversion works, the way a coal plant works is, is pretty straightforward. You take coal, you pulverize it into a fine dust so it burns more efficiently. You inject air that mixes with the coal again so it burns more efficiently. You transfer that energy, that heat energy, into a liquid in a heat exchanger. That water turns into steam. The steam turns a turbine. The turbine turns a generator, and it produces electricity. And then all coal plants have some sort of emission control to remove the particulate and some of the greenhouse gases, certainly not all of them by a long stretch, um, that go out the stack. And there's also a slag disposal a lot of that unburned coal, it's about somewhere around 5% of the coal that we burn ends up as slag. So that 1 billion uh, tons of coal that we burn per year, do the math, 5% of that ends up someplace that has to be stored as a waste product. And there's heavy metals, arsenic, all kinds of things in that coal waste. Next slide. Okay, natural gas. Next slide. Again, it's a high, uh, fossil fuel produced over millions of years. It uh, is primary methane. It can include ethane, propane, butane, and pentane. It's, in its purest form, it's colorless and odorless. And I'm sure if you've ever smelled that you had a natural gas leak or propane, you've smelled propane, that's actually an additive called mercaptan. And the reason that's added is for safety reasons. So if you do have a leak, you can actually tell that you have a leak, right? In 2003, 70% of new single family homes use natural gas. Natural gas is something that for home heating is very prevalent in the United States. Let's go ahead, next slide. Now, this is showing a natural gas combined cycle plant, which is more efficient than a standard natural gas plant. But what it does is you inject, again, you're burning that fuel to turn a turbine, to turn a generator, to produce electricity. Well, there's a lot of energy left in the off gas. There's enough energy where you can put it into a heat exchanger, produce steam to turn another turbine, to turn a generator, to produce more electricity. So a, a, uh, a heat recovery steam generator, that's what this HRSG and this combined cycle plant makes this uh, more efficient than a standard gas turbine plant. Go ahead, next slide. Oil, we're not going to talk a whole lot about oil, but we, 19.5 billion barrels consumed in the U.S. every day, it clearly is the primary source for transportation. It used to be a primary source for heating homes back well over 100 years ago. It's now less than 2% of our electrical needs. And we import 50% of the oil we use, mostly through Mexico and Canada. And Saudi Arabia and Russia are the biggest oil producers in the world. Go ahead, next slide. Geothermal. Geothermal is another potential source of energy that is used. In fact, uh, Iceland 
gets anywhere from 65 to 70 percent of its energy, electrical energy needs, because of its regional, uh, that it has geothermal available uh, from geothermal energy. Uh, the Earth's core is up to 9,000 degrees, and you, the water coming out of these geysers can be up to 700 degrees. Geothermal is used in 2,100 countries and a modest 2,700 megawatts in the U.S. So it's fairly low percentage in the U.S. Go ahead, next slide. And a geothermal plant, the way it works, is basically you're taking the hot liquid, putting it through a heat exchanger again. You see there's a common theme here. We're going to produce steam that's going to turn a turbine, that's going to turn a generator, that's going to produce electricity. Okay? And then uh, the energy that's been removed from that liquid is injected back into the earth where it's reheated, and you get the cycle on the primary side. Okay, next slide. Hydroelectric, we got, uh, I can't remember what the percentage in South Carolina is, but it's not very high here. Out west you get a lot more hydroelectric, obviously. Next slide. Hydroelectric plant, again, very straightforward. You have this potential energy sitting behind a dam that goes and turns a turbine through a penstock, turns a turbine, which turns a generator, which produces electricity. Okay, next slide. Wind, solar, keep going. Wind, solar, and biomass are just a few percent in the United States. And wind and solar um, are really both solar, if you think about it. The, the, the weather patterns are driven by the sun, and, and so you can kind of group those together. Biomass, you can think of this as fossil fuels in a couple of million years. They're organic materials that uh, we can use wood, corn, uh, garbage. Isn't there a garbage plant out at the uh, Savannah Riverside? Aren't they operating a biofuel plant? I think they are, yeah. yeah. Biomass, plant. Biomass plant. Okay, next slide. Okay. I'm not going to talk about a, a lot about nuclear fission because uh, Bill's got a whole presentation on it. But one of the things about nuclear fission is the energy density, and we're going to get to this in a minute. Um, there is a lot of density. If you think about the progression of energy over hundreds of years, you started out with fire, and then we figured out the petroleum thing and coal thing, and then we progressed to uh, nuclear energy. And each one, the, the amount of energy in the, in the amount of material increased, a lot more energy density in nuclear fission, which is a huge advantage. Go ahead, next slide. And nuclear fusion, we haven't figured this one out. It's how the sun works. And uh, Bill, I think you talk about this a little bit, but the problem with this is no structural materials that we have can, can uh, handle a nuclear fusion reaction. Go ahead, next slide. Okay, so how much energy do we use? Next slide. We use a lot. This is in units of quadrillion BTUs, and quadrillion is, can be used different throughout the world, but in the United States, what does quadrillion mean? 10 to the what? 10 to the 15th, right? That's, and a British thermal unit, anybody know what a BTU is? BTU is the amount of energy it takes to increase the temperature of one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. Or if you, a common household, you know, those uh, stick matches, if you light one of those stick matches, that's about a BTU, approximately one BTU. So right now in the world, we consume somewhere four to 500 times 10 to the 15th British thermal units. And of that, the United States uses about 25% of that, of the entire world's energy. What is our percent population in the United States compared to the world? You got about 300 million and there's 6 billion people in the world. What does that work out to, just rough math? Right. 6 billion, 10% would be 600 million, so half of that, 5%, right? Right, right around 5% or so of the world's population uses 25% of the world's energy, okay? Go ahead. And there's a moral thing we're gonna get to about conservation and why that's an important point. Kind of right here. The projections for the future are, gee, the energy demands, and these are in percentages, 
Developing Asia is going to go up 129 percent, and this started in 99 through 2020. And we're start we're seeing this. Like uh, we were talking about, China's building a coal plant a week. They're trying to produce energy and come up to our standard of living. In North America, it's only an increase in that 20-year period of 35 percent, which pretty much uh, stays with the population demand. Go ahead, next slide. Okay, so. Here's this concept of base, intermediate, and peak load, or load following. And this is shown a 24-hour period from midnight all the way through midnight the next day. And you can see during the, this base load, we need plants that can supply that all the time, that are operating. This is 24-7 operation. So they have to be efficient, and they have to be cost-effective to operate. And then these are those kind of daytime plants, intermediate plants, typically 30 to 60 percent of our power needs, and then upper 10 or 15 percent, where we were shown with this demonstration, the peaking power plants. But so base load, minimum needed in 24 hours. They need to generate dependable power, continuous, reliable. And the main base load plants in the United States and the world are coal and nuclear. Okay, we get 50% of our energy in the United electrical energy from coal and about 20%-ish from nuclear. So most of our base load and most of the base load part of that comes from these. Uh, geothermal and hydro can be used as base depending on where you live, if you have that available. Like I said, Iceland has about 65% of their energy needs from ge geothermal. Okay, next slide. Intermediate load plants. This is that gap between the base and the peak load, 30 per, uh, to 60 percent of the time they're operating. These are typically like daytime operating plants. Wind and solar can be considered immediate power sources. Uh, they're intermittent by nature, fluctuates with the weather patterns. And clearly, as we discussed, they're really not uh, viable for base load type needs. Right, next slide. Okay, Peak demand plants. Um, these operate 10 to 15 percent of the time. They're expensive to operate relative to the amount of power they produce. Most often, they're natural gas and sometimes light oil plants. Okay, next slide. Okay, so who uses the energy in the world? Next slide. Can we shut the front lights off on this one for a second? This is. Uh, John, where did you tell me we got this picture from? This is a good representation of where the energy is used in the world. You can see the eastern seaboard of the United States and the entire United States, Europe, Japan, Pacific Rim. But look at all these areas where there's not a lot of power that's used. Now, some of those, the population density isn't very high, but some of them, the population density is very high. So we'll get to that moral conundrum here in a second. As you can see, that North Korea is completely black. All their money is going into nuclear weapons. OK, next slide. And this is what I was talking about before. I apologize that it's not as readable as I'd like. but. The, the population in the United States shows 4.6% of the world's population with 25% of the energy used. Compare that to a place like Africa where there's 13% of the world's population but only uses about 3% of the energy. And all of those nations are trying to rise up and um, provide better lives for their people. And when we talk about conservation in the United States, we have an obligation to do that. But if we think about the rest of the world, we can't relegate them to not being able to better themselves. So conservation is part of the answer, but certainly not the whole answer. Next slide. 